dias to everybody. So yesterday, uh, we discussed the very important sensor parameter repeatability. Difference in output readings at the given value of measurement, because input value is sometimes called measurement. The same value of measurement and differences in the output reading. Uh, the next parameter is span, operating range, operating full scale range. So the range of input variable that produces a meaningful sensor output. In the case of uh, gas sensors, as you know very well, there are some sensors operating at, let's say, sub PPM range. Some of them are operating in the range uh, in a single percent. So, depending on the application, we have to select select the right range. Noise. Noise, as we already discussed it briefly, every sensor, like every electronic component, element is noisy. It's noisy. This is a noise is a very it's a very difficult part of electronics. Not so many people have a deep understanding of noise. And when you are dealing with noise you have to be very careful. Because many people who are writing books, they are simply rewriting from each other. So the same mistakes are repeated again and again. If you go deeply into noise, noise field, you can find out these mistakes. And there is an American scientist, he already passed away, who spent all his professional life working on noise. He really had very good, deep understanding. So this book is highly recommended. He knows what he's talking about. This is a difference between him and other authors. So, as we said, uh, we have a different noises depending on different type of noise, depending on the frequency range. Uh, we have to we have to distinguish we have to distinguish uh, internal noise sources <coughs> on from uh, electromagnetic interference. Because if your laboratory is, let's say, located close to the metro station, or trams or buses, electrical buses, metro, so there is a strong electromagnetic interference or next to the uh, power stations or industrial uh, buildings you are experiencing electromagnetic interference. So we have to distinguish internal noise from external electromagnetic interference. Both of them are disturbing our output. Now, external noise will become more important as the transducer size is made progressively smaller. So, internal noise, we have different sources of internal noise. Thermal noise, 1 over F noise, Johnson noise, Schottky noise. They have different frequency spectra. In other words, using plain language, they are important in different regions of wavelengths. So all of them, all of them uh, could influence the signal-to-noise ratio. However, from other point of view, they could be very useful source of information. Why? Because when you are dealing with certain type of sensors, the sensing mechanism is based on phenomena occurring at the molecular level. And uh, when you are going to repair your watch, 
your watch you are going to the expert who has the proper tools he's not using ordinary hammer to repair your watch he has subtle tools similar story with in a sensor field what does it mean? It means that when I am dealing with phenomena occurring at the molecular or atomic level, I have to use the right tool, not the ordinary tools like used in measurement technology, like for instance, fast Fourier transfer or lock-in amplifier. They are hammers, hammers at this level. Noise occurs at the very low level. This is the right source of information. And sensor, gas sensor field, gas sensor field, some people already use noise as a source of information to assess the gas concentration. Very subtle tool, very subtle, precise tool could be used successfully. Output. There are other parameters of sensors like output impedance because usually sensor is integrated with a signal processing system. We have to use several blocks in order to amplifiers, uh, modulators and others to get the output signal in a desired form. For instance, when we are dealing with um, uh, thermistor, the simplest example, the transfer characteristic is resistance as a function of temperature, but when we want the voltage out, the output signal in the form of voltage, we have to put this our thermistor in a Wheatstone bridge, in one of the arms of Wheatstone bridge, and as a result we are getting voltage as an output signal. So output impedance is important to match sensor with a signal processing system. Grounding, grounding, grounding. When you are dealing with a sensor operating in real world, in, for instance in industrial environment, you have to think about grounding because it must be, common mode must be established among different parts of the system. So, if it's not the case, if it's not the case, the system is unstable. And grounding is a really art. This is not a craft. I remember when I worked in the U.S. and I was doing grounding for a particular type of molecular sensor. It took me substantial amount of time. It's not easy job. It's not easy job. And you can you can do it. It needs, it needs certain experience and, 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 and patience to do this. So as you can see, isolation. We have to reduce undesirable electrical, magnetic, electromagnetic, and mechanical coupling among various parts of the system and between the system and the outside world. When we are working at the university laboratory, this is not a big issue because in a gas sensing field, what we are doing? We are simply uh, measuring, we are testing sensor, we are measuring dynamic performance, we are optimizing temperature, we are uh, measuring static characteristic, and that's it, and publishing paper. Good result. Nice morphology of the nanomaterial, other microcharacterization results, and it's a nice paper. Yeah, for industry, this is the first step, only first step. They are taking our results and working a couple of years in order to develop a product, to commercialize this, and they have to take into account all these parameters, all these parameters, and this is the serious job serious job. Of course, including packaging. Packaging. As I said yesterday, very difficult task. 
especially in mechanical sensing domain. Mechanical sensing domain. But also, it's important in chemical sensing domain because, as I said yesterday, typical sensor arrangement contains many materials with different properties. For instance, different temperature expansion coefficients. All these materials are, when the time passes, they are behaving uh, in a different way. And the major, the major nuisance, they are internal stresses. Internal stresses. And these internal stresses are causing poor long-term stability. Because we are, we are not able to control them. We are not able to predict what will happen in the next two months or two years. We cannot do modeling job for internal stresses. We can do modeling job today, as I said yesterday, today. But tomorrow is a different situation. So, instability and drift. Instability and drift, as I said, everything is aging in the in, in real world. Everything is aging. Materials are changing their properties. Yeah? So as a result, we are observing instability and drift. We can observe, we can observe both. When we take into account calibration curve, calibration curve, in the case, let's say, of carbon monoxide sensor, carbon monoxide concentration, resistance, conductometric sensor, the simplest case, we can observe both drift of the initial point as well as a drift of sensitivity because this calibration curve will change its slope with time. So both in sensitivity drift and zero, uh, zero input. Zero input. So when the carbon monoxide is not present in a gas chamber, zero input, this point also drifts, drifts with time. And again, this is a big job, big job for company which will try to commercialize our university laboratory developed sensor. Because what is the usual technique to get a good stability? What they are doing? They are exposing sensor through the relatively long period of time to the cycles of cycles of, in this case, carbon monoxide concentration. So the sensor stays in a gas chamber, let's say six months, six months, and they are going from the dry air or nitrogen. Gas chamber is filled with a dry air or nitrogen. And pumping, let's say, 100 ppm of carbon monoxide. And again, zero, 100, and so on, so on, so on, during six months. So this cycling, this cycling could substantially improve the long-term stability. They have uh, money, time, resources, they can do this job. We are not able to do this job. Yeah? At the university laboratory. Now, environmental parameters. I already mentioned there are very important parameters because they are influencing the input of the output of the sensor, output reading of the sensor. Already listed these parameters. Temperature, humidity, earth magnetic field, vibrations, electromagnetic interference. All of them are got influencing the input together with our input signal, together with the uh, carbon monoxide concentration. Yeah? All of them 
are influencing the output signal. And part of the output signal is not only due to the carbon monoxide concentration change, but also due to the change in these parameters. All of them should be taken into account and suppressed. Their influence should be suppressed as much as possible. As much as possible. In a, different techniques are used. For instance, in a gas sensing field, industrial companies, what they are doing? They are using filters. Filters. When we are dealing with the real gas mixture, they are filtering this gas mixture. As a result, only carbon monoxide interacts with the, with the gas sensitive layer. Others, other components of the multi-component gas mixture are stopped by the membrane, proper membranes. This is the proper, this is the simplest, straightforward technique. We can also use different techniques in a gas sensing field. No? Function, functionalization techniques. Our nanomaterials could be functionalized in a proper way. So as a result, it will respond not if the gas mixture contains 10 components, it will, it will, so our sensor will respond, let's say, only to three of them, to three of them. Better than if it will respond to 10 of them, yeah? Our result will be more reliable. Or, or, very subtle method used already employed by our brains. Our brains are operating on a newer neural network uh, base. Yeah, that's the reason why we are able to selectively sense different aromas or different tastes. In the real world, we are using pattern recognition software, sensor array, array, training, calibrating every sensor in the array towards particular gas component in the mixture and later building intelligent sensor. And using proper technique, as I showed you during the plenary lecture, for instance, when we are using linear discriminant analysis technique, the response of the sensor to different components will be located, will be nicely separated in a, a LDA space. So this is very elegant way. So different ways, different ways of dealing with, with uh, selectivity and as well as uh, uh, to some extent environmental parameters. All sensors should be temperature compensated, humidity influence should be suppressed and in some cases, in the case of let's say gas sensors, uh, earth magnetic field will not influence, will not influence our, our sensor out, but in the case of magnetic sensors, of course, this is a vital, vital parameter. So we have to always have in our minds the real world situation. When we are dealing with any type of sensor, we have to assess what sort of environmental parameters are crucial from the sensor output point of view. Now, some people, some people are trying to assess the overall performance of the sensor, taking into account all these parameters, all these parameters. And they are calculating the overall, overall performance. And this is, this is, this technique is well described in your in your uh, handouts. 
handouts are distributed, so you can read this because we have no time to discuss this in detail. We will come to this very important part of, of this lecture, which is taken from my professional experience. Basic engineering understanding of the sensor. Basic engineering understanding of the sensor. First steps. First steps. One of the ladies asked me how to measure cadmium concentration, heavy metal, <coughs> present in, in seafood, very dangerous for our health. I said that it could be done as well as measuring the concentration of other heavy metals, like for instance mercury. Mercury. On the corridor, we had a brief discussion. No, mercury is a very nasty heavy metal because if it enters our body, we cannot remove this to the end of our life. It's very difficult to remove. And dentists, dentists, some of them are criminals because they are using mercury-based fillings. For our, so when you hear that dentist is going this job, leave this dentist for the rest of your life and change the dentist immediately. Because you, you will consume mercury in the next couple of years until this feeling is still functional. So, the first step, as I said, is to have in mind output-input relationship, transfer characteristic. This is first step. The next step is to build the so-called transduction chain. Transduction chain. We have to go from input to output, block by block by block, in order to get output signal. They are this is, the, this is the sensing process in the terms of energy conversion. Transduction chain leading to the output signal, input-output. Sometimes, sometimes this is only one block. Sometimes there are many blocks. Many blocks, depending on, on several factors. So we have to build this transduction chain if we are going to deal with basic engineering understanding of sensors. We have two types of transduction chains. Two. First of them is a direct. Direct. For instance, in the case of this is example with pressure measurements. Input value is a pressure change. And we are getting directly electrical signal on the output of the first block. And later, signal processing system one, two, or more electronic blocks giving us the desired electrical output. So all of these quantities are electrical quantities. This is direct. Indirect, indirect, again, input value is a pressure change, but we have an intermediate non-electrical quantities. Like in the case of membrane, which we already briefly discussed. We will do this again more deeply. Pressure is causing membrane deflection. Membrane deflection is generating internal stresses. And if piezoelectric, if piezoresistive elements are diffused or implanted into the elastic membrane, we are getting the output signal in the form of resistance change. That's right. And later, later, we can use electronic blocks to get, if we are not happy with resistance, we can get output signal in the form of voltage or frequency or current, depends on the need. Okay, now, let's discuss 
simple sensor for mercury vapor concentration. Simple sensor, you can do the job easily. Easily. Here in your laboratory. And you can use the same technique for gas sensing. So, let's go to the slides. This element, this element, uh, is commercially available. Commercially available element is so-called quartz crystal microbalance, QCM, QCM, quartz crystal microbalance. This element is widely used in electronics. Quartz is a piezoelectric material. Electronics for high quality electronic oscillators. Why? Because the resonance card, resonance card is very sharp. Is very sharp. We can get for particular element, we can get very well defined resonant frequency. So in other words, we can design oscillator with very stable frequency. Stable frequency, in different range different range depending on the quartz dimension. Quartz dimension. So this quartz plate, quartz plate has two electrodes. Gold electrodes, commercially available, gold electrodes or silver electrodes. It costs, the price of this is, let's say, on the range of, uh, in the case of gold electrodes, single dollars. Why? Because this element is, the production volume is very high. They are producing this in hundreds of thousands, millions of pieces, millions of pieces. It's widely used in electronics. So, we can buy it. No need to fabricate. No need to fabricate. Now, I said that for piezoelectric material, we observe, we observe resonant characteristic. This is F. This type of resonant characteristic with resonant frequency M0. Which type of Electrode materials should be used. Of course, gold is preferable because gold is a noble metal and it's not oxidized, it's not reacting with the environment. Silver, silver, it will, when interacts with the surrounding environment, sulfonization, sulfonization. Sulfur is present in air. And sulfur, everybody see that sulfur is causing the silver to be blackish. Yeah? What does it mean? It means that this sensor, sensor based with silver, any type of sensors, when silver is included, will suffer from the poor, long, short and long term stability. That's right? So we. Gold is preferable. Gold is preferable. Now, this element was also used last 80 years, 80 years, in microelectronics. Why? Because it's a mass-sensitive element. Mass-sensitive element. When people were depositing even in the early 30s of the last century, when people were depositing thin layers, thin layers, they, they wanted to know when to stop the position process in order to get the desired thickness of the material. 
because this is a mass sensitive or gravimetric, some people call it gravimetric element, when they get certain output signal, they knew that the layer thickness is, let's say, 500 nanometers, so they could stop. Several years ago, and the performance of this element is described by Sauerbrey equation. Sauerbrey equation. The output signal of this element, this is direct transduction chain. Mass change, mass change is causing frequency shift. Frequency shift, yeah? Because mass change will cause the shift of this resonant part. So we have a different <coughs> resonant frequency and this is a, this is our output signal, frequency shift. This is the delta L. was the idea how to measure, how to use this element for deposited layer thickness measurement. Now, look at this Sauerbrey equation. Frequency shift is directly proportional to the square of resonant frequency. So what does it mean? It means that the higher resonant frequency, the stronger output signal. Yeah? stronger output signal. Also, depends, depends on the uh, accumulated mass density, which is clear, and mass sensitivity factor. Dependent on the crystal dimensions. Plane thickness, mainly plate thickness, plate thickness. Now, this commercially available sensor, fortunately, has a gold electrode. It is well known, it is well known, that when the mercury vapor molecules are interacting with gold, with gold, this is very nice interaction from chemical point of view. Mercury vapor is nicely absorbed by gold. So, as a result, mass deposited on the surface will change, will change, yeah? And this characteristic, this resonant characteristic will shift to the left side, yeah? To the left side. So, what does it mean? It means that I can employ commercially available element to measure the vapor, mercury vapor concentration. But my question is, am I happy with this arrangement? Or I, 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 can, I should do something more to get the reliable sensor? Everybody thinks. It's a good question. Loudly. We need to change the arrangement. Pardon? We need to change the arrangement. What do you mean? The electrodes area is covered more in this arrangement. Why? When you are saying something as an engineer, you always the always question is why? Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> why? The area of mercury vapor reacts with the electrode is less. No, listen, I am using commercially available element. At the first attempt I'm not going to modify anything. Life should be simple. That's right? Mm -hmm. Mercury is absorbed by gold. Mercury is absorbed by gold. I'm getting frequency output signal. Good news. Good news. I'm happy. But in the real world, the mercury vapor concentration changes. What does it mean from the sensor point of view? I'm trying to pass to you all the time sensor way of thinking, yeah? Sensor way of thinking, because it's very, it's very, let's say, specific thinking. We have to have a broad picture. 
broad picture. The reason why I discuss all these parameters because we have to have in mind all these parameters in order to build a reliable, good quality sensor. There is a response, so it's a first step, yeah? When I'm dealing with my PhD students, they, if, if the new idea is uh, implemented, I'm telling them, from psychological point of view, the most important thing is to get the response. Any type of response. And later I'm working step by step, step by step to, to get better results. Yeah? But first step, if I'm staying in lab, let's say three months, no response, I'm frustrated. If I'm getting response, it means that I'm on the right track. Response, first. But this is the end of the story or not? This is my question. End of the story or not? Let's say I nurse, nurse in the hospital, nurse in the hospital, broken the mercury thermometer, yeah? Some, what they are doing sometimes, you know? Taking this, this small, small spheres of mercury, taking this under the bed or under the carpet, yeah? As a result, people are inhaling this for the next couple of months. Today, mercury vapor concentration was, say, let's say, was 100 ppm. I'm coming back tomorrow with this arrangement. It's 150. Can I get this result or not? My question is. Everybody think. Simple question. I tell you something. Everything in sensor technology is based on a common sense. Common sense. If you have a well-developed common sense, you are successful. Okay? So, tell me. The situation is like this. I will talk. A little bit, not to the end. To the early morning brain doesn't work. You know, I experienced this myself. I came to Mexico City. I mixed, I mixed. Robert Redford with Robert De Niro, yeah? <laughs> Dr. Alejandro caught me. I made one, one mistake, and on the corridor, he told me that I made mistake. I mixed Peltier effect with Zeebeck effect, that's right? So, but today my brain works better than one week ago. Okay, <laughs> look. Let's assume, let's, this is delta F, Output signal, yeah? Mercury concentration, delta H, G, yeah? First, no mercury vapor in the environment. So, this is the, let's take the red one. This is the situation. Now, nurse broken the thermometer. Okay. Yeah? So I'm getting a response. Let's say this is 100 ppm. I'm getting a response. Yeah? Now, next day, second nurse came and she broke a second thermometer. <laughs> so the mercury vapor concentration is higher. Let's say 200 ppm. Am I, what I should do in order to design a sensor? Sensor. What does it mean, sensor? Hmm? Very simple question. Let me excuse you for a second, because I have a very strange habit. I'm drinking a lot of green tea. Every <laughs> morning. Pardon me for a second. 